Welcome to this month's Third Thursday webinar, brought to you by Synergy Settlement Services. The Third Thursday webinar is part of an ongoing free monthly webinar series. Each presentation is done by a Synergy subject matter expert who will tackle difficult issues that arise at settlement. During today's presentation, if you have questions, type them into the control panel where it says questions. The following brief presentation will give you an overview of what Synergy does in 30 seconds. A uh, trial lawyer's job isn't to know all the nuances, to know what it takes to keep Medicaid in place or SSI and preserve Medicare and comply with the Medicare Secondary Payer Act and resolve these complicated liens that may be present. So all of those issues are issues that the trial lawyer really doesn't have the time or the expertise to deal with they need a partner that they can rely upon that can handle all of those issues, and that's, that's exactly what Synergy is. For our third Thursday webinar, my name is Josh Pettengill. I'm one of the founding principals of Synergy. I'm also Vice President of Medicare Secondary Payer Compliance. Today we're going to be discussing liability Medicare set-aside case studies. And these are cases that you've seen in your practice every single day. These are cases that we get calls on every single day and are frequent issues in your cases. Here's our plan for today. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Medicare, how we got to where we are in 2019, starting back in 1980. I'm going to give you a snapshot of the current landscape of Medicare, what's happening on a macro scale with the government what's happening in healthcare trends, those kind of things. And then we're gonna really dive into the disagreements between both the plaintiff and the defendants and the issues that we see arising all the time. And then most of our time today is gonna to be spent on case examples. We're gonna be talking about cases anywhere from eight figure settlements to $10,000 settlements and how, what's the appropriate measure to take on those cases to make sure your law firm is protected and your client is protected. Also going to hit a little, some alternatives to met, doing a Medicare set aside and then finally best practices. But I want you to stay with me as we grind through the first couple slides and before we get to the case examples because it's very important. These are some of the Medicare headlines I pulled just this past week in regards to the Medicare Trust Fund. These are national headlines. The Medicare Trust Fund to fall short after 2026. Medicare Social Security face shaky fiscal futures. Medicare funds face insolvency. Social Security, Medicare, uh-oh. A lot of attention in recent weeks about the Medicare Trust Fund. Medicare Trust Fund is losing a lot of money. And one of the ways that Medicare and CMS is trying to preserve the Medicare Trust Fund, believe it or not, is by way of these Medicare set-asides potentially on liability claims. Now, over the years, there's been plenty of discussions about the Medicare Trust Fund going broke. And as of today, it has not yet happened. And here's a little snapshot of a chart that shows the di different years and also the estimated time frames of when the Medicare trust fund will actually go broke. Uh, by most recent estimates, 2028 is still the time frame for when potentially the Medicare trust fund is going to go broke. That has not changed and that came out as recently as two weeks ago. So it's getting a lot of negative attention. And this issue of the Medicare Trust Fund liability Medicare set-asides has become a low-hanging fruit from CMS's standpoint, something that they tried to wrap their arms around years and years and years ago, but they just weren't quite able to do that. But this has become a forefront topic for them, and they've made it very clear that liability Medicare set-asides and establishing formal guidelines for Medicare set-asides on liability cases is coming. Going back to April of 2018, they gave us a time frame for a rollout of formal guidelines. So if you look at this time frame, 18 months back from April 2018, uh, that puts us somewhere back at the end of December of 2019 or towards the end of the year 2019, when we may see something actually happen. Now, do I believe this is going to happen? It's anybody's best guess because we've heard this story so many times before. It's like the sky is falling over and over and over again, but they continue to do nothing. But I have a little different mentality this time because of the actual conversations that we've had with Medicare. And we try to step in and advise Medicare, and we have been doing that for years and years and years on what's in the best interest of our clients, the plaintiff, the whole plaintiff community, and the injury victims. 
if they're going to bring this to the market, if they're try going to try to establish formal guidelines for this, we want to make sure that it's in our best interest of our clients. And we've been fighting this for years and years saying, you don't have the authority to do this. You don't have the wherewithal. You don't have the resource to do that. And thankfully, up until this point in time, you as plaintiff attorneys and trial attorneys haven't had this uh, been formally introduced to you. That being said, uh, it has caused disturbances in settling your cases. What I mean by that is because there's so much bad information in the marketplace, uh, going back 10 years plus, we've so started to slowly see these developing changes as far as what's happening practically. What I mean by that is these insurance companies, the defendants have started to take a hard line position on whose obligation is to protect Medicare's interests. And they're also making it business to make sure that Medicare's interests are protected, even though, uh, as you'll see here shortly, that it's really not their issue. It's a plaintiff issue. So last year, CMS called some informal meetings with select groups of folks and select stakeholders. And there was a series of four or five different meetings that included meeting with the AAJ, that included meeting with the largest insurance uh, representative, representatives in the country, that included meeting with the National Alliance of Medicare Set-Aside Professionals, which I am the former uh, past chairperson of the Liability Medicare Set-Aside Com Committee of that group. So CMS opened their doors and said, sit down, guys. This is what we're thinking about. What are your comments? What are your thoughts? So quite a few years ago, they did this uh, th through the way of the public. What I mean by that is they opened the floor to anybody to make public statements and public comments in regards to some proposed rulemaking in regard to liability Medicare set-asides. And I'm proud to say that Synergy was one of the only firms in the country, especially the only firm on the plaintiff side, that actually provided feedback directly to CMS on this issue, this issue and said, look, again, you can't handle this, stay away from this, but if you are going to make this a priority, here's how it needs to be addressed, okay? so. Here are some of the takeaways from those town hall meetings, and this they've gone on record. This is not official. This is unofficial, what they said. And this comes directly from the National Alliance of Medicare Set-Aside Professionals, which is the only group in the country dedicated to this industry, to Medicare secondary payer compliance. And they issued a bulletin last year that summarized the, the, t the key take talking points and the key takeaways of what Medicare is thinking. Number one, they've said the liability Medicare set aside is going to be a plaintiff issue and that more importantly, defendants and insurance carriers are not a target. I say more importantly because why your cases are being slowed down to the finish line is because the defendants and the insurance companies are saying we have skin in the game. We are worried. We've got the deep pockets and rightfully so we're worried that Medicare is going to come back to us if Medicare's future interests aren't properly addressed. On the record, CMS said, look, we're gonna make this very clear that this is a plaintiff responsibility, this is a plaintiff issue. And that's why I'm talking to our clients here and trying to educate them from day one saying, you've gotta take the bull by the horns and address this issue on the plaintiff side and not wait to let things happen as the case plays out. And CMS has also indicated that their enforcement mechanism is actually denying services. So. Fundamentally, what happens is when you settle a case involving a Medicare beneficiary, if Grandpa Jones is a Medicare beneficiary and goes to receive treatment for his accident-related care, Medicare, if they see that or have some means of seeing that, they could potentially deny that on the basis that, look, this is related to the accident. And how they do that is through Section 111 reporting requirement, which they spent millions of dollars and years and years and years developing as a way to track current Medicare beneficiaries. And so as of today, that faucet hasn't been turned on, so to speak, in the sense that they have not been denying services. So in the old days when you settled a case involving Medicare beneficiary, as long as the conditional payments were satisfied, there was no doubt in your mind that Medicare was gonna pay all day, every day, for things that are accident related as well as non-accident related. Where the change is gonna be shifting is that when you settle a case now, potentially involving a Medicare beneficiary, if there's going to be future care necessary or required or even recommended, that's when it becomes a potential problem as far as Medicare getting that bill, auditing that file and saying, hey, wait a minute, why are we getting this bill when we know you had a personal injury or liability settlement? We shouldn't have to pay for this until our interests have been adequately considered. 
CMS has also indicated that they will publish a liability Medicare set-aside reference guide. So last year, uh, going back almost two years ago, there was an invite-only group that of about 12 to 13 people that spent multiple weekends going through what's called the Workers' Compensation Medicare Set-Aside Reference Guide. It's essentially the roadmap for handling Medicare set-asides in the workers' compensation space. It gives you a guide to how to prepare them, when to submit them, how they should be administered, all those things, when they're appropriate, when they're not appropriate. That guide only exists in the context of workers' comp, the workers' comp space. But CMS said, look, when we establish and introduce formal guidelines, we're going to supplement that with a liability reference guide. And I'm proud to say that we have worked directly on this Medicare set-aside liability reference guide to make suggestions to them, even going as far as editing the entire workers' compensation reference guide they have now to say, look, if you're going to take this to liability, here's how it's got to be. Now, whether or not they actually take any advice or any recommendations to heart of what us or any of the other you know, plaintiff trial lawyer groups suggest to them is yet to be seen. And I know when AAJ uh, met with CMS, they left very frustrated after that meeting in the sense that it seems like Medicare is never just going to understand, truly understand liability cases. And hopefully again, they will take our recommendations to heart and actually if they do this do what they were told so here's medicare's basic positions whether it's right or wrong or indifferent it all goes back down to the medicare secondary payer law this passed in 1980 and this was the law that says anytime there's workers comp no fault or liability insurance medicare doesn't want to be stuck paying the tab essentially so from Medicare standpoint, I'm summarizing clearly, but from Medicare standpoint, if your client, Joe Smith, gets a settlement for $100,000 and $50,000 of that is earmarked towards future medical care, from their standpoint, it's like double dipping in the sense that we shouldn't have to pay if there's this other pot of money that's out there that exists. So this is the only law that exists out there. There's no mention of what a Medicare set aside is or what it does or how it works, but anytime CMS makes a reference to liability Medicare set-asides and the mechanism for enforcing this issue, it always goes back to the Medicare secondary payer law. Some of you may have seen this slide in my other presentations. It's a staple for me because it's so true and what Medicare's position is. It says, this is the face you make when your friend invites you out to dinner and tells you they forgot their wallet. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a dinner or lunch and the check comes and Somebody's diving underneath the table or they run to the bathroom, they forgot their wallet. That's exactly how CMS acts. If there's another wallet at the table or another pot of money available, they want that pot of money to be paying before they pick up the tab. And by the way, if you don't know who that person is in your group or network, you are that person. So what is a Medicare set aside? A Medicare set aside fundamentally is exactly what it sounds like. It's literally money that's set aside from the settlement. So if you settle a case, let's say it's a $5,000 Medicare set aside, that $5,000 functions a lot like a deductible. That 5,000 bucks from a practical standpoint is a good faith estimate of what future medicals will be that are covered by Medicare and related to the accident. Future Medicare, Medicare items related to the accident. So once that 5,000 bucks is spent down, spent appropriately, Medicare is back on the hook in theory. So what that means is when you settle a case, and your client is considering whether or not they need to treat in the future, if they do, you as plaintiff attorney should advise them that, look, you're on Medicare, you're gonna have the potential for treat for money, maybe you should consider setting aside some money to make sure Medicare's interests are protected. And the purpose of doing a Medicare set aside is to cap the exposure of any out-of-pocket money that Medicare is gonna have their handout towards, entitled to, or potentially have their title to. Too. So what that means is, let's say using that $5,000 example, that's a good faith projection. Maybe the future care is going to end up being $50,000 for that client. But at the time of the settlement, look, based on all the facts of the case, 5,000 bucks was the number that was estimated to be the correct amount. And if that money is spent appropriately, again, no matter what the amount is, Medicare can't come back knocking on the door and saying, you didn't protect our interests. So the purpose of doing it, obviously, is to protect Medicare's interests. Medicare said, look, you don't have to do a Medicare set aside, but our preferred way of 
protecting our interests is a Medicare set aside. And oh, by the way, you have to protect the Medicare trust fund. And the best way to do that is a Medicare set aside. So if you're going to do a full air inside a caution approach as it relates to a client that's on Medicare and has to treat in the future, you want to at least consider carving out or setting aside money. Doesn't mean you have to do a formal analysis by any stretch of the imagination, nor does it mean that you have to spend a bunch of money to get that report done. It could simply mean just carving out a pot of money, good faith estimate. and make. But if you're going to do that, you got to make sure it's properly documented how you came up with that number. Protect the injury victim. Clearly, we don't want the Medicare's benefits to be cut off for the injury victim. And there's this distinction about what could potentially happen. So from a Medicare standpoint, if nothing is ever set aside, Medicare has gone on record to say, if nothing is set aside, we consider the full settlement to be the Medicare set aside. And what that means practically is that they expect the plaintiff to spend down their entire settlement in theory before they would pick up, which sounds asinine and crazy because it is, but that was is their position. You don't carve out a good faith number, we consider the entire settlement to be a Medicare set aside. One question we get frequently is that if we go to verdict and reach a verdict in the court awards future medicals, is that entire future medicals considered to be the Medicare set aside? That answer is no. So in that situation, obviously there are things that are covered by Medicare and things that aren't uh, related to Medicare. The, our position, if we're going to be addressing a case like that, is how do we carve out what the Medicare covered items are and then post that on how do we come up with the lowest number possible? You as plaintiff attorney, your obligation is simply to determine whether or not future medicals are funded, and if they are, how the Medicare trust fund is going to be protected. So CMS has also gone on record in the form of the policy memorandum that says, look, it's plaintiff's responsibility to consider whether or not future medicals are funded, not defense. So the first problem we have in the market is that there's a tremendous amount of information about liability Medicare set-asides, right? And what I mean by that is whose responsibility is it? Here's the slide that you need to print and need to bring to mediation next time you have a mediation involving Medicare beneficiary. CMS has been very definitive and very clear about whose obligations they are as it relates to conditional payments and closing out the liens, okay? Everybody has skin in the game. Both sides, all parties, that lien has to be satisfied. And oh, by the way, it has to be satisfied in a timely manner. As it relates to futures, CMS said, is the responsibility of the defendant to report any current Medicare beneficiaries, okay? And there's actually a guidebook for the reporting side of things. And oh, by the way, in that guidebook, it says current Medicare beneficiaries. So your takeaway there is, look, if you have a client that's near eligible for Medicare, that case is not going to be able to get reported. It's impossible. So, for example, let's say you have a client that's age 63, or let's say you have a client that's on Social Security disability benefits, but they don't have a current Medicare number, that case cannot be reported. So, if you're getting jammed up by the defendant requesting information from your client <clears throat> as far as what their basic demographic information is for purposes of reporting, you have no obligation to give it to them. And at the same time, the argument, you could show them directly from the reference guide that it only relates to current Medicare beneficiaries. And if you're interested in that reference guide uh, as a follow-up point, reach out to us and we'll send that to you, the exact reference from the guidebook. Now, as it relates to future interest, this is a plaintiff issue. The worst thing that could happen is you settle a case, you cut your client a check, they go to treat for something down the road for the accident, Medicare flags it, denies it, and says, we ain't paying indefinitely. Now, what happens there is your client could potentially come back knocking on your door and say, Mr. or Mrs. Plaintiff Attorney, why didn't you educate me about the issue? Why am I benefits getting cut off or denied or, or suspended? Your obligation as plaintiff counsel is simply to have the discussion with them and document it and say, look, you know what? This is something that you need to consider, and here's why. And here's what I recommend. And if they say thanks, but no thanks, you got to make sure to document your file and document your file to the nth degree.
that's all you can do. It's almost like a special needs trust for clients that are on Medicaid. You, the only way to preserve Medicaid eligibility is to establish a special needs trust. At the same time, you can't force a special needs trust on your client, but you can offer it to them so they don't lose their Medicaid eligibility. Same goes for Medicare set-asides. Here's a recent case example on a Chicago case, and it was an $18 million settlement where there was a giant Medicare lien, so obviously Medicare was going to be aware of the settlement. It was a catastrophically injured man who was in a vegetative state. Now, after reaching the agreement, uh, the plaintiff attorney, our client, received this letter. A, this is a terrible slide. I'm going to summarize it for you. In short, the defendant said, look, we have to do a Medicare set-aside. We have to consider Medicare's interests. And oh, by the way, we believe that should be at least $1.1 million. At least $1.1 million, that $18 million needs to go into a Medicare set aside account. Okay. So after we looked at the case, reviewed the medical records, reviewed all of the facts of the case, we came up with a number of $156,000, which adequately considered Medicare's interests, which is a true cost savings of almost a million dollars that goes directly in the client's pocket. Very proud of that, that we were able to do that. The takeaway there is you can't rely on the carrier to advise on what's best for your client ever. That sounds very elementary, but you'll be shocked about how many calls we get from plaintiff attorneys that are relying on the defense to control the issue and also suggest and make recommendations. And this is what happens all day, every day in workers' comp. Unfortunately, on the workers' comp side, where Medicare set-asides got their start, so to speak, that process is controlled by the insurance company. So if you can imagine a scene where you as a plaintiff attorney are relying on the defense's life care plan to sell your case, you would never do that. So the same can be said as it relates to Medicare set-aside. If one has ever talked about or proposed, you have to have your own expert involved. And the takeaway here, again, is CMS to say that it's the plaintiff attorney's responsibility to decide if future medicals are funded. I'm going to repeat that probably multiple times throughout this presentation because it's that important to reiterate that this is a plaintiff issue. Don't take the word for the defense. It's not their problem. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the risk that is involved for the plaintiff attorney side is that you settle a case, cut a check to the client, and Medicare flags it, audits it, and to try to deny future care. And I've highlighted this case example before in previous discussions, but it's worth mentioning. There was a case that we were involved in several years ago, over five years ago now probably, where a plaintiff attorney called us up and said, Josh, you got to come meet with my law firm right away. So I got on a plane, flew down there, held up in a conference room with about 30 of his colleagues, and he opened with Josh. They settled a case two years ago for $80,000. My client recently went to go get a shoulder in surgery for her shoulder injury related to the accident and Medicare refused to pay for it. And now they're knocking on my door, threatening a legal malpractice suit and also fi filing a bar complaint because now my benefits are getting disrupted. That is the exposure that exists. Now, there's no case law out there where a plaintiff attorney has ever sued. This is the first time I ever saw it happen. I've since seen it happen two other times where there was the threat of a legal malpractice suit for failing to advise properly on what they should have done. So you have to document your file. You have to have that discussion. And a good time to have a discussion about the Medicare set aside issue potentially is when you're talking about conditional payments, everything related to Medicare. So I know that you're already having those discussions ahead of time with your clients about conditional payments and that Medicare's interests have to be protected. So it's a good time to talk about the concept of Medicare set aside. So it's not a big surprise to them if they think once the case settles that they may have to set aside some additional money to protect Medicare's interests. It doesn't become a road bump um, or bump on the road or a barrier to settlement to get the case closed in, in a timely fashion because you've already had the discussion about the issue. Problem number two, the carriers are writing the checks to resolve the liability claims. So they're holding the checks hostage. Okay, we're getting this call 15 times a week at least where uh, the, the care is saying, we're not going to cut a check until we've properly addressed Medicare's future interests, whatever that means. Okay. And to go along with that, the other problem is, is that these carriers, these defendants, when they're trying to force a Medicare set aside, 
on our clients, it's usually getting introduced at the 11th hour, and it's also getting introduced improperly. And this slide really encap encompasses and calculates what their position is. They're trying to literally jam a square peg into a round hole because they're so used to doing workers' comp. Now, workers' comp, when that case settles, dollar for dollar is paid on future medicals. Huge difference on liability, right? Arguably, every single case settles for a reduced amount of the full value of the claim. Every case, no matter how big the recovery is, no matter how big the verdict, the judgment is, you can make the argument, present it to a court, present it to whoever, that your client is not getting dollar for dollar the full value of that case. So what's happening by these defendants and these carriers, when they're actually trying to force the Medicare set-aside, they're introducing these giant Medicare set-asides because they're saying you need to fully fund that obligation, which becomes a huge problem when there's a finite amount of money. And it comes a huge problem when there's no funds available to fund that Medicare set-aside. And we've had to go to court on behalf of our clients, had to get the judge's blessing to rule on a reduced Medicare set-aside. We've had to do that. Unfortunately, you don't want to ever have to do that. That's a last resort because right now, Medicare is only reviewing liability Medicare set-asides on a case-by-case -case basis. Meaning if you try to get Medicare's blessing on a case right now, a liability case, the odds are they're not even going to review it or approve it or even look at it. So for example, if you have a case in California or a case in Florida, if we, tr if we do a Medicare set-aside, a formal Medicare set-aside, prepare and submit it to Medicare for their review and approval, we're not even get a response from them. So the de facto and default mechanism as a last resource becomes having the trial court or probate court or some other court bless the allocation of the Medicare set aside amount. And Medicare is going on record to say they will honor that. In lieu of getting CMS approval, they will honor a court's ruling on that. So, the other default option by the insurance company, and I blogged about this recently, is that they want to get a letter from the treating doc saying that no future care is necessary. So Medicare has given us one exception or a get-out-of-jail-free card from doing a Medicare set-aside, and that's actually getting a letter from the treating doc can be short and sweet on their letterhead saying, you know, at the time of this settlement, I don't see any future care necessary or going to be recommended to the best of my ability. I, that's what I predict. Okay, obviously circumstances change, but if you can get that letter, Put it in your file, you can go on to the next case and not have to worry about it. And if you're interested as a takeaway, again, please follow up with us. We can send you template language to get that uh, letter from the doc because there's no suggested language for that. There's no downloadable um, template or letter that Medicare puts on their website, but we have that information if you're interested in doing it. The problem is, again, is that this ain't a one size fits all scenario. There are situations when a Medicare set aside isn't the option. There are situations when you can't get a letter from the treating doc. So what are the carriers missing on this? Well, clearly they don't take into account all the facts of the case. For example, caps on damages. What about the cost of procuring the case and settling the case? What about policy limits? What about contributing factors? Whose fault was it? Were there pre-existing conditions? All of these things come into play if you're considering a Medicare set aside and actually doing one. And it can be very difficult to do that. And that's why us at Synergy as experts, we, in full disclosure, we have nurses and experts and consultants that all they do is review medical records and put together these reports. And uh, we were the first firm in the country to, to say, look, you have to look at all these different facts of the case. You can't just fully fund a Medicare set aside. And we've, we've took, gone back to Medicare from day one and said that, look, this is a problem. This is a fundamental difference between comp and liability. And I firmly believe that they have not introduced formal guidelines because they have not been able to wrap their arms around uh, this equitable distribution or reduction type analysis or um, coming up with a fixed methodology for that. But the bottom line is all these things have to be taken into consideration. And if we're doing a Medicare set aside post settlement, post settlement, the goal becomes how do we carve out the lowest possible number that protects everybody's interests? Some of the mandated terms that we're seeing is that, um, you know, I'm aware that no further medical expenses or drug expense related treatment I've received or will receive in the future will be submitted to Medicare. I understand that if Medicare is not protected, Medicare may see all benefits. 
So basically, they're trying to tell your client, look, you need to sign off on the dotted line that you're not going to bill Medicare ever again, which is asinine because most doctors just by nature just send their bills to Medicare. So even if we do a Medicare set aside, oftentimes what will happen is these providers, these doctors, even though they've been informed by Medicare about this liability Medicare set aside issue uh, numerous times throughout the years, they just are so naturally used to billing Medicare that those bills may slip through to Medicare. So you can never have your client sign off on something like this, but this is what they're trying to get your client to sign off on. And they also say Medicare may cease all benefits. That's not true. It's only accident related benefits where potentially Medicare could deny something. I understand and agree that I would not make application of your disability benefits. These are handcuffing your clients' ability to, to better their lives and improve their lives. And shockingly, we've had clients that have had their clients, and I say clients, plenty of attorneys had their clients sign these things. And one of the most common calls that we get is about release language. And it, they're trying to hook the plaintiff counsel in that it's their problem and that they should sign off on indemnifying uh, the insurance company and take on the responsibility of protecting Medicare's future interests. Now, as I mentioned, plaintiff's counsel's responsibility is to identify whether or not future benefits are funded, but at the same time, they can't force their client to do a Medicare set aside. So anytime you see and plaintiff's counsel written in the release that relates to Medicare, strike it out, get rid of it. And I encourage you to always push back on these type of release provisions um, so that you don't handcuff your client in any shape or form or your trial firm, your law practice. Now, why are these things popping up? They're popping up because um, Medicare has been threatening for a long time that they're going to start fining the responsible reporting entities, which are the defendants, up to a thousand bucks a day. Now, up, up in this point in time, they haven't been forcing anything, right? But a few months ago, CMS announced their intent to issue what's called a notice of proposed rulemaking on Section 111 reporting penalties. So this concept is being introduced again that there will be formal penalties that are levied against insurance companies and defendants for failing to report in a timely fashion. So you have two schools of thought here, and this is what we see on a practical basis. Number one, you have those defendants that just never report their cases. They just don't. And you have the other opposite extreme where you have these defendants, these are sports responsible for entities that are rushing. As soon as you may have a tentative agreement in place, they're rushing to say the case settles. And that creates a huge problem. This happened last week on two different cases, one in California and one in Florida, where there was a, a verbal discussion about a tentative agreement and nothing was actually officially settled. But at the same time, the insurance company rushed to settle the case. Medicare triggered and kicked in the, the file demand stages, all of a sudden the client's benefits were getting denied. And also on top of that, the interest started running on the conditional payment. So once Medicare issues their final demand, you have 60 days to pay that off when the juice starts running on that tab. So you need all the time in the world for that. And also, more importantly, you want to make sure all of your claims get lumped in the final demand appropriately. So if this ever happens to you, you have to go on the offensive and reach out to the adjuster and say, look, this case isn't settled. You need to put something in writing to Medicare that this case hasn't settled so I can give that to them so they slow down the process and put the brakes on issuing the final demand. And oh, by the way, still paying for my client's benefits. So in order for that to avoid that happening, what you can do is make it very clear about it's and again it sounds so elementary that whether or not we have official deal in place or don't have official deal in place now i understand oftentimes you want to make you want to get a deal done quicker than others because of certain issues but at the same time there can be a trade-off there in doing that their medicare benefits get disrupted so the takeaway here is look communicate often and early with the adjuster or defense attorney and make it very clear that we have a deal or don't have a deal. And the date that deal is actually official. And we have some clients now as a, another key takeaway that before they even go to mediation, okay, this issue of release language is addressed. Okay. They're saying, look, 
before we even get to the table to sell this case, I want to have draft language that addresses Medicare's interest. Now, they don't go openly say that, but that's the purpose of it is to, to mine through that on the front end so that the Medicare set aside at the 11th hour doesn't get introduced and dropped in your lap once the case is officially settled. Now, I'm not saying or suggesting to do that on every case, but on certain cases, it is worth the extra time involved to have agreeable release language prior to going to the mediation table. Here's a slip and fall case I wanna talk about that $100,000 settlement could be a $200,000 settlement, could be a $50,000 settlement. It's, you know, these are the, the bread and butter slip and fall cases that a lot of you are settling. And there may be a future surgery recommended. That client may or may not ever have that surgery. Medicare has a lien. The case has to be reported under Section 111. Medicare is going to be aware of that case. What do you do, right? What do you do in these scenarios? So there are some firms out there and some companies out there that would say, you need to do a full-blown Medicare set-aside analysis, pay a couple thousand bucks for that. Oh, no, by the way, you need to submit that Medicare set-aside for review and approval to Medicare, which is both of those statements are asinine. The review process is voluntary. And as I've mentioned previously, it ain't happening right now. It's just simply not happening. They're only reviewing large eight-figure cases for the most part, what we've seen. They're very difficult to get approved. Just, just in that sense. But going back to this bread and butter case, if you want to err on the side of caution, you would explain to your client, look, if you're going to have this surgery, you need to set aside a good faith number to protect Medicare's interest. And maybe you have a doctor, it's very straightforward, that says, look, the cost of that surgery is 10,000 bucks. You tell your client, look, set aside some of that this money in a Medicare set aside, which means going down to the local bank, open up a savings account, and having that as insurance policy. And the Medicare set aside really is insurance policy at the day. And that's the approach we're, we're, we have with our clients is look, a Medicare set aside is an insurance policy. And all likely Medicare is going to keep paying, like, which the, like they have been. But if they don't keep paying, you, you need to make sure to have some money set aside so it doesn't cost you any extra dollars to you. So in this example, again, let's say there's a $10,000 future surgery recommended. We, we factor in procurement costs when you factor in the full value of the case, maybe it's a couple thousand bucks that gets set aside in an account. And as long as you can properly document why that was set aside, it's still better than doing nothing. Again, my takeaway here is look, you don't have to do a formal set aside in every case, but if, you, if you're worried about it, set aside a good faith number, maybe it's a set percentage of the, the net recovery, maybe it's 10, 15% of that recovery, maybe it's based on a recommendation from the treating doctors, but it's better than doing nothing. Document that your client did that, have them sign off on something, stating they've done that, go on to the next case. This common working file is something that everybody that's a Medicare beneficiary has on them. And this is really what gives Medicare the ammunition to deny something potentially. So going back to section 111 data reporting requirement, all that case information gets dumped into the common working file. So anything that's case related can be flagged potentially down the road. And a lot of people don't know about this common working file, but every single person that's on Medicare has a common working file. And now Medicare has actually gone on record to say that they're sharing this common working file with their Medicare Advantage providers, which potentially gives them the ammunition to deny something. I've never seen over tens and tens of thousands of cases a Medicare Advantage plan deny something up to this point in time. Medicare Advantage, we don't have time to go into today, but in short, it's really just the private health insurance plan. But Medicare now is sharing the common working file with their Medicare Advantage providers. Policy limits case. This is a situation, real life case, where there was a $500,000 settlement on a paraplegic. And the future exposure on this case was probably over 30 million total. We factor in economic, non-economic easily over 30 with non-economics, but the economics alone are over 30 million. But unfortunately, it was only a $500,000 policy. That was $250,000 in liens, which they were able to reduce. But they, of course, the, the carrier tendered this policy immediately. It was a horrific, horrific accident. Very clear liability. 
they wanted to get the case resolved, not being on the hook for bad faith. And ultimately, when we got this call, we we told it, we walked the attorney through this, the, you know, the facts of the case, and we told them, look, there's just simply no money left over to fund future medicals. Therefore, there's no need to set aside anything. And there's a case called Sterrett versus Clobart, where Medicare interests were considered, inadequately considered, yet there was no, no Medicare set aside. And it's a pretty large settlement, obviously. So the judge looked at all the facts of the case and said, you know, it was a $650,000 settlement where a neighbor was having a party and the guy fell down the stairs and became paraplegic himself. It was a large consortium claim. The judge said, look, you know what? I've looked at everything and considered everything. There's just simply no money here to set aside. Therefore, there's no need to do a Medicare set aside. So in this particular case, we didn't do a Medicare set aside, but we properly documented the file to include in the release that there was no money left over to fund future medicals. We also put a damages paragraph in the release that said that both parties recognized the full value of this claim is much, much greater. And also we put together what's called a no MSA letter for their file, an evaluation letter stating that from Synergy, an expert saying there's no need to do a Medicare set aside. Ultimately, you got to have a process. And this is what your process is going to look like. Number one, determine if future medicals are funded. That's your trigger point, assuming you have a Medicare eligible client. Number two, educate your clients on the risks of failing to do anything. And number three, select the appropriate solution. Ultimately, it comes down to consulting with experts, advising your client about their responsibility and then documenting your file. You can't force their hand to do a Medicare set aside, but you can give them options. And we can come in as experts and have these discussions with them to take that off your plate, make sure your trial firm is insulated, make sure your client's protected, let them make a decision. Now, if we're doing a Medicare set aside, our end goal is always the same. How do we come up with the lowest MSA or come up with no MSA and still be compliant with the MSP statute? There are a lot of ways to do that. Here's a case example of how we reduced a liability Medicare set aside where it was a policy limits case of 500,000 bucks. The proposed MSA amount by the insurance company was 116,000 bucks. We took a look at that case based on all the facts of the case and, just, and made a recommendation that $7,198.51 be set aside, which is a huge savings for the client. End goal, how do we come up with the lowest number possible? There are a lot of ways that we do that behind the scenes, and there's case law to support that. There's a case law named Benoit versus Neustrom, Benoit versus Neustrom for those that aren't from Louisiana, which was the first case where a judge actually looked at all the facts of the case and decided that he was going to reduce that Medicare set-aside number down significantly based on all the facts of the case. And there's always room to do that post-settlement, in our opinion. Here are some options that you have as trial attorneys. Um, we can do an MSA needs evaluation letter for you. So if you identify a case involving a Medicare beneficiary, you can take a look at that and say, okay, based on everything that's going on with this client, based on their needs, based on their recommendations by the doctors, based on their health insurance, should a Medicare set aside even be considered? And surprisingly, more often than not, especially on the bread and butter cases, I call them cases that are selling for $100,000 or less, we're able to put together a no MSA letter for your file so you have the peace of mind as a trial attorney that your client is going to be protected. Now, if Medicare ever audits the file, you've got a, a letter from us saying that no need to do a Medicare set aside and Medicare's interests have been properly considered and here's the reason why a Medicare set aside was not considered. The other thing we offer is called a Medicare set aside consultation waiver where Synergy is experts, Medicare approved experts, board certified Medicare experts have these discussions with your client and say, look, here are the, here are the options. Number one, do a formal Medicare set aside, set aside some money in a separate interest bearing account, spend it the right way, make sure Medicare is considered protected. Or number two, you can do whatever you want to and take your chances. And if they say, Josh, thanks, but no thanks, we'll put together a very comprehensive waiver for the client to sign that says, you, the trial attorney, recommended they consider Medicare's interest. 
doesn't say they recommended dual Medicare set aside, but recommended they properly consider Medicare's interest. And they elected on their own accord not to do anything. You brought in a third party expert who also explained this to them, and they still elected not to do anything. It's a very comprehensive waiver. You stick that in your file, you go on to the next case. Now, number three, third tier, is the full blown protection of the Medicare set aside allocation, or what I call Medicare set aside analysis, where that involves our firm looking at all the medical records, maybe there's a life care plan, looking at all the facts of the case, coming up with a, a number that we recommend be set aside. Along with that, if you get us involved on any of these services, obviously we're gonna provide recommendations and guidance to you on things like release language, on things like having discussions with your clients, the practical implications of these things. These are very important. All of that's included, uh, with a price if you're doing a full allocation. Medical cost projection, you may have situations where you don't have a client that's on Medicare or not ever gonna be eligible for Medicare where we can do a medical cost projection. It's very similar to a life care plan where all benefits, excuse me, all damages are quantified, medically speaking, versus Medicare covered and non-Medicare covered. It's a great way to establish damages on your case. In lieu of spending $20,000 for a life care plan, spend 2000 bucks and get the same report and it's based on a medical record review and sometimes a conversation with the client themselves uh, that's the only difference between the life care plan and the medical cost projection there's no physical examination involved by our nurses we also offer a medicare set aside trust solution so if a client ultimately does set up a medicare set aside they can decide whether or not they want to administer it themselves or they can have a third party like ours or someone else that gives them a card that they show their providers and doctors, those bills get negotiated, audited, they get paid appropriately, appropriate county measures are taken for that account, um, dealings with CMS are all handled, all that's under the same blanket of professional administration. It's very low cost these days. It used to be cost of fortune to get Medicare administration. Now it's very, very, very low cost. And we're the only firm in the country that offers a trust solution. So it offers the max protection for that client. It's an irrevocable trust where we have a professional trustee as well as a professional MSA administrator to make sure that your client is protected. I would also encourage you to take advantage of complimentary CLEs and MSA training. I'm speak clients and training for your law firms. A lot of what we do is, is a lot of our time is spent educating our clients, whether it be uh, the paralegals, whether it be the legal assistants, whether it be the investigators, whether it be the trial lawyers. We spend a lot of our time developing best practices for their firms and helping them um, identify those clients and identify those cases and also handle those cases properly. There's been a couple uh, recent lawsuits by the government where trial lawyers were sued for failing to properly address Medicare's interests as relates well to conditional payments. That trend is going to continue, I assure you, and we don't yet have any case law out there or a situation where that's happening as it relates to futures. But the takeaway there, it's important for you to develop these internal processes and procedures as it relates to Medicare compliance for your law firm. So if and when Medicare does actually introduce formal guidelines, you are prepared and you're ready for it. So here's your litmus test when a Medicare eligible client potentially comes across your desk. Number one, is the plaintiff eligible for Medicare? Yes or no? right? Number two is future accident related care possibility or recommended. Number three, does the case fund future medicals? And on that note, it's important to mention that if you have a situation where medical records are involved and different opinions are involved, from a Medicare standpoint, what holds the most weight is what the treating doc is saying is required. So you may have five IME doctors saying that the surgery isn't required or is pre-existing, but if the treating doc says on record that it is, the Medicare is always going to default back to the treating physician. Something to think about. And if the answer is yes to all of these questions, you should consider a Medicare set aside. At the very least, have a discussion with your client that this is something that they should consider to protect Medicare's interests and consider Medicare's interests properly. But if the answer is no to any of these three questions, then we can possibly, and, and most situations put together this no MSA evaluation letter, we charge 500 bucks for it, where you, the trial attorney, brings in a third party expert, 
who evaluates the claim and says, for these reasons, there's no need to do a Medicare set aside. Real quickly, there are alternatives to doing a Medicare set aside. We talked on and on about um, doing a Medicare set aside, but in reality, Medicare doesn't deal in the real world as it, as it comes to, to protecting their interests. If you have a client that's on health insurance, as long as they maintain that health insurance, there's never going to be a shift in burden of Medicare to pay for that care, right? But Medicare's position, formal position, is we don't care if there's any other future, any other health insurance, excuse me, to cover future medicals because they could lose that coverage and then be back on the hook. We, being Medicare, be back on the hook to pay for that care. But again, practically speaking, as long as your client maintains private health insurance, there's never going to be an issue with Medicare. Your plan can pay out of pocket as they go. Oftentimes, clients like to do this. They say, Josh, you know what? I'm just, if I do have to treat, I'm going to pay it out of pocket as I go. Or if Medicare comes back and says I owe money, I'm just going to pay out of pocket directly. Still a reasonable way to consider Medicare's interest. The problem there is that if their care ends up being inordinate, and greater than anticipated, they could be spending a heck of a lot more money that way had they just set aside a Medicare set aside, which is a good faith estimate on the front end. A medical savings account is, is something also to consider in lieu of doing a Medicare set aside. Plan can set up a settlement preservation trust to earmark for future health care. Uh, my partner was involved in a horrific accident a couple of years ago and set up a settlement preservation trust that was used specifically for his healthcare needs, okay? Again, if this is a, an option to do, it should be considered. It's definitely, in my mind, the same thing as a Medicare set aside. It's just the, we're not, it's just not formally done or formally gone to the steps doesn't mean it's not a Medicare set aside. That's the other takeaway for this talk is that it doesn't involve always getting a report, but it does involve a good faith estimate that's being set aside to be used, quote unquote, to protect Medicare's interests. And a settlement preservation trust is one way to do that. A structured settlement uh, can be designated to fund future medical care. Again, instead of setting aside a formal pot of money, you have situations oftentimes where a client will elect to set up a structured settlement where we can assist in doing that for no cost, get the best price, best payout, the best company and that's going to pay them a fixed amount per month or per year that as that money comes in if they have to treat they're just going to use that structured settlement money to do that all these are viable options uh, to, to doing a traditional medicare set aside account best practices for you and your law firm you got to start early you got to start early in finding out and identifying who your medicare eligible clients are there's a one-page form that we can send you it takes 15 minutes for your client to go down to the local Social Security office and fill out. You can even be authorized to do that on their behalf. Or in 15 minutes, they can find out if they're eligible for SSDI benefits, SSI benefits, Medicare, Medicaid. When does all that start? So when you go to settle your case, you're not surprised by any of this information of potentially having a Medicare eligible client. You got to start to control the process from start to finish. I'm talking about everything. Establish early on who's going to handle additional payments. Establish early on whether or not a Medicare set aside needs to be considered. And if if so, that you as a plan for attorney are going to control it. Don't let what's happening in workers' comp start to happen in liability. I'm sick of seeing it happen in workers' comp where everyone just goes along with whatever the defendant recommends. It cannot happen in plaintiff liability cases. Don't let it happen to you. Never rely on the opposing side's expert as it relates to any of these issues. Again, be proactive. The earlier, the better. If you have a case, if you know for sure you have a, a sizable case involving a Medicare eligible person, get us involved early to do a Medicare set aside. So there's no surprises at the end of the case. I can't tell you how many times that we've been involved in mediation. The case is medium, maybe mediated three or four times. And now all of a sudden, the concept of a Medicare set aside gets introduced. Now the client starts to worry and freak out because now they've realized that less money is going in their pocket, so to speak, and has to be earmarked towards Medicare. It causes problems. So the solution is get us involved early. It's also a solution for helping the case finish quickly 
and resolve efficiently. If you have the MSA analysis done on the front end, it's already, already teed up for you on the back end. It doesn't become a smoke screen or a separate side case. When a case settles, make sure the correct data gets reported. What I mean by that is ICD codes get reported under Section 111 data, data reporting requirement. Now, at the start of your case, there may be many, many conditions that you're claiming as compensable. But once the case settles, you got to drill down, really drill down to say, okay, let's take a step back. What is actually compensable in this claim? What are we claiming? What are we going to put in the release? So as the error on the side of caution approach, some of our clients are actually putting ICD codes into the release itself, into the mediation agreement itself. So if the defendant happens to report the wrong information, it doesn't affect your client because that, that's what happens. Is we've, had, we've seen that happen where maybe your client had a shoulder injury, but the defendant reports the neck and the back. And now when the client goes to treat for the neck and the back, Medicare denies it or flags something. We don't want that to happen. One way to eliminate that potentially from happening is to put the ICD codes. It can be short and sweet, and the release says the, the parties agree that the ICD codes and the compensable body parts claimed are the following. Boom, 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 put in the release, go on to the next case. And get connected with CMS and Synergy updates. If you're not hooked in to our e-newsletters, you got to do that because we're so far ahead of the game on this issue and have been for many, many years. We're on the inside with CMS. We're on the inside with the plaintiff's bar and the trial attorneys all across the country. We're on the front lines, we're in the trenches dealing with these issues. So again, we're gonna be fighting for you as plaintiff attorneys and the injury victims to keep doing that with Medicare. Medicare, you can always also sign up on Medicare's website to get their announcements, whether it be uh, for conditional payments, whether it be just for general updates, whether it be for anything, futures. I would encourage you to jump on their website. It takes two seconds to sign up for that, that uh, newsletter. Do that today. Here is our contact information. Here's my contact information. A lot of time is spent on the phone answering questions, and this is still going to be a very murky issue as we trudge through this for the next few months and see what happens with CMS. But I'm confident that you can all develop your own internal practices uh, to fundamentally shift what's happening in the market, where you as plaintiff attorneys control this issue it doesn't become a smoke screen at the end of the case. It becomes just the standard that plaintiffs have controlled this issue and Medicare's issues get dealt with quickly and appropriately. I thank you for your time and I look forward to, to working with all of you.